All right, looks like we're going. Welcome back to another one of these things where we just kind of talk about whatever things, stuff of interest. We'll see where this conversation takes us. Anyway, hope you're having a fantastic Monday. Yes, it's just the start of the week. Had a Wonderful, like, a little bit longer weekend. Uh, this week, this past weekend was my birthday. Saturday was my birthday. So where I'm at, I'm able to take off a day around my birthday, uh, kind of treating it like a holiday. So I took off Friday uh, after making sure my team was all good on Thursday. I was able to just to kind of coast along on, on Friday and Saturday. And then you wake up on Sunday being like, I got to work. And then you're like, wait a second, my alarm didn't go off. What day is it? It's only Sunday, and then you have a whole nother day off, and that's honestly pretty fun. Um, or at least I think it is. I like it's it's like a nice little surprise. Um, Heather, who take she takes off, uh, she takes advantage of a thing that our company does called flex hours, um, where you do a little bit more work every day, but you add that together and then take off that time uh, when you choose to in, on a regular basis. So. In her case, she's doing a little bit of extra time every day so that she can take every other Friday um, off of work. Um, so she gets to have a three-day weekend every other weekend, which is honestly um, pretty envious at this point, having just came off of one. Um, it's one of those things that's like, you don't really know you like it, and then you have it once, and you're just sort of like, gosh, I could definitely get used to that. And I'm kind of like one who, who would... Like it was one of my coworkers who who introduced me to this mindset, but being able to take off a Friday rather than a Monday, like do the three week, uh, three week, three week weekend, the three day weekend <clears throat> from the Friday spot is usually a little bit more favorable than the Monday spot, um, just because when you do get back into back into work, you're if you're coming back in like a day after everybody else, they've already gotten a chance to get kind of the Mondays out of their system. So they're kind of, they've already like shaken off the dust of the weekend and they're um, kind of going a little bit full force. Um, whereas like if you're coming in on that Tuesday, then you're sort of like, uh, well, my Monday is just really a day behind your Monday. And we just never, never quite sync up on that first day back from a, oh yeah, we're working now, we're in work mode. Whereas taking that Friday off, Yes, you have a little bit more time, a little bit more to like catch up with on Monday, but you already kind of treat Monday as a catch up day, uh, just for like getting out of your your uh, your weekend state, um, so to say. But that's just that's kind of me. I'm sure people do fine in either way. Like winding down for the weekend is a little bit. They don't want to wind out wind down earlier than other people do during the week um or if like there's a lot of stuff that come that goes on at the end of the week that you want to be there with your team for then that could be a reason to do it the other way around um but i've just personally found it like really nice to take a friday off rather than a monday off and um just kind of keep going but again if you just take the whole thing off that works too like i, I loved my december i didn't have to i just i didn't i didn't have work for most of december um and in that case, you don't you don't have to go back for the week. Your your Monday is basically three weeks after you, you stopped working for the year. I, I digress. Um, but yeah, another interesting thing that kind of happened this weekend was uh, one of the things I do is I volunteer at a local arboretum. Uh, Morton Arboretum uh, is nearby. It's a pretty pretty well known one um, in the United States. They work with a bunch of other. Um, arboretums and uh, botanical gardens like uh, across the United States uh, for just doing a bunch of research um, named after uh, Joy Morton who founded it he was also the um, I almost said founder uh, he might have been the founder I think he might have been a founder uh, at least a CEO for a time of the Morton Salt Company so kind of an interesting like side thing to start and then it just spins off into its own living museum which is pretty neat it definitely didn't start that way he just wanted to collect um plants from around the world and ended up bringing back um trees from china when he was visiting and was just like you know what i want to keep doing this and just made this just space for people to come and see 
plants from around the world. And each time that the um, that the organization changed hands, that the Arboretum uh, got a new founder, it stayed in the family for a very long time. But still, even even when it would be passed down to the next in line, like their mindset like just shifted like a lot. Like Joy Morton's was, I want to bring in things from around the world, and the the one who took, I can't remember like the whole line there, but right after that was just sort of like a big expansionist type thing. It's like, let's try and work with the area around us to get more areas so we can get more, um, more collection, more living collection in here. And then I believe it was the third who was just like, you know, it'd be really good. It's like getting all this stuff here is great, but what do we do like from an educational standpoint? We're bringing this all here so people can learn. How do we get more people in here? So you built like this educational institution right in the grounds so that people can come in and learn more about the uh, about the collections as well as just appreciating them which is really really cool in my opinion probably the most resonant um of the of the sort of founding principles there and it's just kind of it's just kind of neat uh how the whole thing formed but i do volunteering um with the with the morton arboretum um Usually, I think it's usually the first two Saturdays of every month, uh, just like a three-hour block of natural areas um, management, which is really just seed collection, seed dispersal, seed cleaning, or um, brush pile management. Uh, I don't do any controlled burns, which is uh, when you're uh, in in the United States. We still have some of these, but they're not as... Uh, prominent as they used to be prairie ecosystems and like woodland prairie ecosystems and a part of how that system actually or that ecosystem came to be a thing was because of uh, Native American uh, management of the land by using fire so they would sort of guide um, guide other animals that they were hunting and managing their land by burning it uh, not all the time but enough so that the enough that a lot of trees wouldn't take hold or a lot of like woody species wouldn't take hold but you get this really amazing just variety of grasses that would grow grasses and sedges um, and other herbaceous flowers uh, or plants uh, which is just really really cool um, and I do a bit uh i don't do like those like controlled burns we do those here like you'll you'll see if you see like uh like signs up that are like a controlled burn is happening um or you see like just a bunch of people like like dressed to be to be handling fire and they're like setting like some of the ground on fire chances are they're they're doing something for a reason uh, that's to make sure or maintain a, a, a prairie ecosystem uh, into the future. <laughs> um, it's one of those things that when I saw it, I was just like, what are they doing? That seems really crazy. Why are they doing that? Seems bad. And really, it's just a way for this ecosystem that was here when the, when the European settlers came here is still kind of maintained to this day. Even though we don't have much remnant prairie, like real, I don't want to say real because it's all real, but... Um, what are those originals, original prairies left? So we're maintaining a lot of restored prairie. We have one of those at the Arbor, or a few of them at the Arboretum actually, but one of them was like our biggest success, um, the Schulenberg. But I'm getting kind of ahead of myself. Um, and there's just a bunch of other like volunteer type things that you can do just being hands on outside about things. And that's some of the like best volunteering you can do right now at a safe distance. So. Like they have other things like you can help out at events and things like that if you're more of like a people person but not running too many of those right now um still in a pandemic stay safe um so there are certain like really low amounts of people and you can stay relatively distant from others still masks and things bringing your own tools but you basically meet up and then go out to an area and then you sort of work this area for a bit um while you're um while you're there generally away from other people um definitely more than like 10 feet away from from the the next closest person usually much more um but in the time between uh working that i usually go to um say like lay on a on a 
log somewhere and just sort of stare at the sky for my break, but decided to go sit around a fire that um, that people had set up and was just sort of staying generally far away from people. But one of the other volunteers was talking to me and she was asking me, like, we talked a bit and we started volunteering at about the same time um, a few years ago. So we've been talking with each other a bit about kind of like our aspirations and things when we're out there. And she went into horticulture and she got a job in horticulture um, as well. Uh, she's been doing that and just trying to find more ways to do more environmentally impactful stuff. Um, and I've been talking about how, like, I do the Prismatic Planet website and how I wanted to get into volunteering and how I think environmental education is really important and want to do more with that. And um, I talked a little bit about some of my some of my like plans for what I'd like to do. And we were just sort of she was asking like if I'd made any progress there. And I was talking about some of my designs and things and just like having somebody to talk to about these kinds of things like just sparked like this really just big like thing of inspiration to go do something really cool with the with the knowledge and skills that I have. Um, so I don't know kind of what that what sparked that like I've, I've worked with these ideas for a long time now like since 2019 like I still have notes from like the end of 2019 when I was just like how can I make an arboretum better how can I take an example of a living museum and turn that into something that engages with people more so that they learn more about the environment and a lot of the stuff that I'm now getting back into designing are things that I've written down from year, years ago just how do I put an API in front of the uh, getting a little tech here I, I'm, I'm approaching it from a tech standpoint just because that's what I know it's one of the skills I have um, architecting and just building things as an engineer um, but building an API, structuring their data, finding their data, scraping it all, and putting it into a structure that works and can be used throughout the entire uh, facility, and then making things more digital uh, around like where things are. And in talking to this person, I'm like the the other volunteer. I'm like it's one of those things that's kind of a a difficult like it's it's sort of a balancing act. You're you don't want to introduce any forced forced digital digitization of anything that's within the arboretum. You won't you don't want to just start throwing a bunch of like kiosks or uh, like tablet devices and things. Maybe like put those into like the the um, already like the the pedestals you have that are like saying like these trees are are this and people use them for this and things like that those are great they're very analog and they take you it they sort of take you out of your digital space your very um technological world and you're back in with nature for a bit and sometimes people go to these places to escape that and that still resonates with them having that analog way of learning something but it's also not terribly accessible like we're assuming that people are on paths and a lot of the trees and plants that you'd go to or want to see you're appreciating them from the path not a lot of people are leaving the path when using um using visiting the arboretum I like to go out in the grass and like be around the trees and that's where you'll find information about them like what they're called when they were added um like where they're like where they're originally from and things like that that stuff that information is tied to the tree it's on a tag on it and not all of them have it but the ones that do you have to go out there and sort of walk around the tree and the grass and find them but a lot of people don't do that and it probably makes sense people don't like the groundskeepers do a really good job of taking care of everything so everything looks really neat and orderly and you don't want to like walk on that so we have a bit of an engagement issue when we're talking about people visiting an arboretum and wanting to learn something the only thing they're going to learn is on the path itself and that information doesn't change ever and some of the key information for identifying the plant or tree is not near the path 
And that means that people have to, one, know they can leave the path, two, wants to leave the path, and three, can leave the path. So that's a lot of things that factor into whether or not somebody will actually go to learn all of what they can from what's available by that tree. And even then, the people who do, you check all those marks and you go there and sometimes the tag isn't even there. Um, so like I was just sort of speaking out loud about how accessibility would be a really nice thing to, to have or a nice benefit to having a little bit of digitalization of that information. So I started thinking about how, how we can incorporate a more not invasive way of using the tech you already have to investigate the area around you. So it's just interesting. And I, I started like talking more about that. I'm not going to talk a lot about it here because we're already fairly late into this, but like I got like really excited to work on these designs for like the first time in a few years. I think I was just like trying to piece together what I want to do with tech. And I couldn't quite figure out if I wanted to like actively build something anymore or what I'd particularly want to do with any one environment. But it's just, I'm just sort of recognizing it's one of the tools that I have and I, I'm pretty good at it. Um, and it's just kind of interesting when, when inspiration kind of hit you because none of this stuff is like new to me. It's just having talked about it again. And maybe I just have to talk about the things that I'm working on more and why it's important. Because I just started doing a ton of research this weekend just on, it's like, okay, so here's what I want to do. And I just like listen to all the components, talked about what, like just details about everything I need for this thing to be successful. Like, what do I need to do for this thing to be done? What things don't need to be done day one to be completely usable and have like real benefit, real value? And how do I put this in front of people? Who do I need to talk to? And can I talk to anybody to get... Um, essentially funding um, to be able to do this. So it's kind of neat. I don't know what exactly it is, just little random sparks that can just sort of start flying. And maybe it was, maybe it was a combination of a three-day weekend and a really nice day on Saturday and having to and just talking about my ideas out loud for the first time in a while around what do I actually want to do with environmental education beyond all of the writing that I'm doing. I think I'm learning a lot about how to convey ideas in ways that are interesting. And I was already fairly okay at that because I'd done a lot of game design when I was learning how to code. My storytelling skills are okay. They're probably not like the greatest thing in the world, but I can at least sell a topic and make it seem pretty interesting and want and have other people want to learn more about it. So. It really is just like a, an amalgamation of all the things that I think I do okay at and just needing to actually buckle down and do the thing. It's kind of where I'm at now. Like, I thought it was weird when I was just like looking for what do I, what do I even want to do next from like a job perspective when like inspiration just kind of hits and I'm kind of like, maybe it is just time to just do, do my own thing. But yeah. You never, you never quite know. Just funny having inspiration kind of hit. Turn, turn 33 and suddenly it's like, oh yeah, you know what? You should just go do that thing. You should just, it, it, it feels like it has value. And like, I think people need to see this thing. See it in action. And give it a shot. So maybe we'll see. We'll see if I build up any kind of confidence to just go, go do this thing. Be doing a lot of, a lot of hard thinking this week to see what what it is that I do next here. Anyway, I think this video was more for me than it was for you, but I hope you enjoyed hearing at least what what that sounds like thinking about what your next career move can be or like when to know an idea is worth investing in or starting to go do something with like when is a time for you to just jump into this thing because I don't know a thing about starting a business uh, I know at least a little bit about convincing people 
I have to do that at work all the time. If I want to build something or I want my team to build something, I have to convince a bunch of people who sign checks to sign those checks so that we can go do something. It's not it's not grant proposals or grant writing or proposal writing, but it's pretty darn close. So if I can just start reaching out to people, then I have that part. And it's not like this is something that I just thought of this weekend that like it's like okay i'm gonna throw everything away for for a thought that i had two days ago these are literally just steps upon steps upon steps of ideas and designs and thoughts over the course of it's been two years now has it been no it hasn't been two years has it been two years it has been it wasn't the end of 2019 it was the end of 2018 that i started doing all these all these thoughts yeah wow it's been a while so yeah it's just a lot of careful thought and deciding whether or not it's like the right time for it so yeah maybe more as i go on through this week if i seem stressed out about decision making then that might be why though i think i'm planning on talking about borderlands 3 on friday just because I played through that and i have a couple things to say about that I was thinking about doing it now. I figured it'd be long. But then this one went up being long anyway. They could have talked about either one. Um, but yeah. Hopefully you get something out of that. Just kind of repeating out loud the things that are in my head right now for that. Um, but if you are at some kind of point like that too, maybe you'll get something out of it. Maybe you'll get something out of just a person just being like, yeah. Inspiration comes and goes. Think about it carefully whether or not you're in a position to do something about it. I'm probably lucky in that regard that I am in a position where I can do that. So definitely don't just throw your only means of making money on the floor and go chase a dream. Make sure that you are able to live while you're chasing that dream. Uh, if you can't, probably keep living first. That's more important. But understanding where you're able to or how long you're able to chase that dream for before you need to reel it back in and do something else again that's probably some things i'll be thinking about this week but maybe i'll maybe i'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on it'll be an interesting series if i'm talking about this this project while it's being made i haven't seen anything like this on youtube before it's just people being very generic about like, yes, I just decided to do this. And they never go into details. So, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe this will be an interesting vlog after all. Um, maybe I'll just have like a day every week that I go over something like that. That way it's not every day I'm doing it. That way I can still do really stupid videos like, I don't know, red berries again. I don't know. Anyway, hope you're having a wonderful Monday and continue having a fantastic Tuesday. And we will catch you in the next one. See ya.